All right, welcome to Rampart Christian Fellowship. Today is June 7th, 2015. My oldest son is 21 years old today, <laughs> but he's out in the National Guard, so he's at, actually out in training, so he doesn't even get to celebrate his birthday. <laughs> but happy birthday, son, if you watch this. So we are in a series of messages titled, The Struggle is Real. And, uh, you know, the, the whole idea behind the struggle, the, the struggle is Real series is it's a topical series of messages that I, that I wanted to attempt to address some of the major struggles that we all face. You know, I, I just look, you know, talk to friends and I see people out there and I see people going through some serious struggles. And so the struggle is, is real is, attempt, is an attempt to, to address those things from the Bible and to give, give us some biblical direction on how to overcome these struggles. Today's topic is relationships. I have seen so many people, so many people's lives um, and their, their walk with God, and, and I've seen uh, so much hurt uh, when it comes to the area of relationships. And, and so I wanted to really dig into what God says about relationships and then how we should prioritize our relationships. Um, and and the, the, the basic consensus of what the Bible says, just so we can get that out in the, in the, in the beginning, um, as Christians, we should love. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, it says, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God has forgive, forgave you. And, and I believe as a Christian, we should always remember that. A lot, often we'll forget how much God has forgiven us, how much, God, you know, how much things we've done and, and God has given us grace. And if we remember that, that uh, that gives us that should give us a heart of grace towards other people, and that should influence our relationships. So, the struggle of relationships. Um, the struggle is extremely real when it comes to the topic of relationships. The quality of our relationships is in direct correlation to the quality of our life. If we have a good relationship with our with our spouse and with our children and with our family and with the, with the people that we work with, you know, it, it directly influences how, how, how our quality of life is. Relationships are based on communication. Uh, if, we, if we want to overcome many of the relational struggles we face, we, need, we, we must be aware of the way that we communicate and, and who we are communicating with. Our communication can either be based on one of two things. I, I kind of drew a lot of cor uh, like like dualized correlations in this study. And, and, and I, basically, our communication is either communicating in the flesh or in the spirit. And so the first passage of scripture that I wanted to touch on, which is very influential in, in our relationships, and I've gone over this, this passage of scripture quite a few times before, but I think it is so important if we want to overcome, if we want to have real equipment. So let's go to the book of Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. Book of Galatians, chapter 5, starting in verse 16. I think this, this passage of Scripture, when I first read it, when I first started studying the Bible, and I came across this part of the Bible, and I, I was like hit by it. It, it. it sunk deep into my heart. And, and for I didn't read anything else out of the Bible for like six months. I just read this passage of scripture over and over again. And I, I read it in different translations. I, did, I, I looked at commentaries on it. I just meditated on it. And I, and, and I, would, I just wanted, when I read this passage of scripture, I wanted to make uh, what it says part of my life. I wanted to understand it so deeply that it actually live it out. And I would hope that when I, when I share it with you guys today, you, you might be encouraged to, to live, live this piece of the Bible. I mean, the whole Bible... As a Christian, you should want to live the whole thing, but I think that goes in steps as you as you be you know, as you walk with the Lord. And and for me, this piece of scripture was was just something that that, re, that the Lord really wanted to do something in my heart. So let's start in Galatians chapter five, starting in verse sixteen. It says, "I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall uh, and you shall not fulfill the lust of your flesh, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another." So that you do not do the things that you wish, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And it starts in verse 19. It says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, uh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, 
outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, or revelries, and the like, and I, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then in verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh and with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, and let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Now, uh, you know, I... I hope that you, that you can see in this passage of scripture how this can relate to our relationships. <laughs> if, if this is in our, if this, if we take this piece of scripture and we apply it to our relationships, it, I believe it can help us to overcome so much of what we see. Because if you look back when it says the, the works of the flesh, now think about a relationship. Uh, I mean, a, a marriage, for instance. The, uh, adultery is, is a violation of marriage, fornication, violation of marriage, uncleanness, lewdness, all these things that, that, that it lists here of the works of the flesh. You see this in marriages that are crumbling. You see these things, and, and, and I tell you that, that this are all part of, of living by the flesh. And then in, in verse 22, where it gives us the, 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 the fruit of the Spirit. Now, if you apply, if you apply those uh, characteristics to your marriage, then you will have victory in your marriage. You will you will live. Uh, you will live a life that, and you, your marriage will succeed. I mean, this is what I've seen in my life personally. So, um, the first fruit of the spirit uh, is love. Now, I, I didn't put it in the notes, but I wanted to. I wanted to touch on it. I'm gonna. I'm gonna read through it real quick. If you want to turn to First Corinthians chapter 13, it talks about what love is. And so this is a biblical explanation of what love, love is. And if we want to have relationships, if we want to l love one another or be kind to one another, we need to know how to what God means when he says love. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, And th though I speak with the tongues of angels, of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I... And though I have the gift of prophecy and all, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have not faith, or and I have all faith that I should remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to the poor, and, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. So it lists a bunch of good things. You know, uh, I mean, you can speak really well. You can, you can understand all the mysteries of the Bible. You can, you can have all this faith. And you can and you can uh, give all, all this money to the poor, but you can actually do all that without love. And and, and I tell you, it profits you nothing. And in, in, in verse four of, cha of chapter thirteen in First Corinthians, it says, "Love suffers long and is, and is kind." Uh, uh, I mean, another tra translation, it, it'll start with, "Love is patient." Yeah, you know, that's what lo suffers long or long suffering means. Love is patient, and, and patience is, is the is the hardest lesson I, I've still I'm still learning. <laughs> In my life, and 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 but but if you want to walk in love, then then you need to grow in patience. Love does not envy. Love is not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in, in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. And endures all things. In verse eight, it says, "Love never fails." And I tell you, if, if, if that's what your marriage looks like, that you're, you're, that you're patient, you don't envy, you don't parade yourself, you're not puffed up in your, in your, in your marriage, I'm telling you, those, those are the things that are, that are going to transform you into, into what a godly marriage looks like, a, a biblical marriage looks like. God wants us to, to have the, this, this image of what it is to be with Him in, in, in heaven. And He wants us to be at peace and and. And, and, and if we live in it by, by love, this is, this is how we should live. We should, uh, should not be rude. We should not seek our own. We should not be provoked all the time. And, th and that word provoke is, is pretty interesting as well. It kind of means kind of um, instigator. You know, I mean, I, and I've seen uh, even <laughs> in my own relationship, sometimes we, we, you know, I, you, when you're in a relationship with somebody, you can instigate things sometimes when, when you get caught up. In, in just weirdness of the of relationships sometimes, and I and I think 
that you have to kind of grow in the spirit to, to kind of get away from that type of stuff. So going along with the whole uh, uh, duality thing, you know, we, so we talked about living by the flesh, look at living by the spirit. We talked about, uh, you know, the fruit of the spirit is love and what love looks like according to God. But th uh, there's two different uh, uh, main divisions and relationships that I saw when I was reading through this study in the Bible. And that's basically you have a vertical relationship with, uh, between you and God, between the creation and the creator. And then you have a horizontal relationship, which is your spouse, your children, your, your, your family, and your, and your, your work relationships. So we're going to we're going to start and we're going to look at what it is to do how, how do we build our relationship with God? How do we get the vertical relationship right? What do we what do we do? And so if we want to build our relationship with God, we need to do basically I wrote down four things and these are four things I have actually you know, shared these things before on the the message I did called priorities. And, and I believe it's, it's so good that I'm going to keep saying it. <laughs> you know, you know, even the Apostle Paul said, I, I, I keep preaching the same thing to you because I want you to get it. <laughs> so so this, is, this is important. So if we want to get our relationship with God, God correct uh, or right, then we need to read God's Word. But, I mean, that's, this is God's, the Word of God, the Bible, is God's revelation to His creation. It's God's love letter, some people call it. And so if you start to, you know, just really get into the Word of God, you start to memorize it, you start to read it, you start to meditate on it, that's going to build your relationship with God. Uh, I put down a couple of verses that support that. Um, and, you know, John 1.1, 1, 1, it's a popular verse. I'll, I'll just read it to you. Uh, it, or I, I have it memorized. It just says, uh, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you understand, so when you're reading the Word of God, you're actually, you know, uh, you're actually in relationship with God because He inhabits His Word. And, and, says, and, and, and later on in, in, in the book of John, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So it, it was the Word was with God in the beginning, meaning Jesus Christ, and the Word became flesh, which was Jesus Christ who became flesh. And so when we're, when we're reading the Bible, we're actually communicating with Jesus. I mean, we're, we're learning you know, what's in God's mind, rather. Um, and then another verse that I put down, uh, Psalm 119.11. It's a good memory verse. It's, a, it's uh, David is writing this psalm. Psalm, one, psalm 119 is going to be probably our next series. Uh, um, this is our sixth month as Rampart Christian Fellowship, and I, I've been doing topical messages for the first six months. But the, our next series is going to be the f first verse-by-verse -verse series that I do, and it's going to be the whole book of Psalm 119. Because I believe that Psalm 119 is such a beautiful example of what it looks like to have a heart after God. In Psalm 119, verse 11, um, David writes, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So, that, so when, we're, when we're reading the Bible and we're memorizing it and we're getting into it, we're doing that so we have spiritual uh, support that we won't, wouldn't sin against God. And it's so, it's so important that we understand how, how, how the Bible... It gives us a spiritual life. You know, we, I mean, a lot of people think that they can go and they, I can, you know, they can be a Christian and they, they don't need to go to church. They don't need to pray. They don't need to read the Bible. And as long as they, you know, I believe it's the way that people have described salvation a lot of times. Some people will take the book, uh, the, the verse in Romans 10, 9 and say, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that, that God raised Christ from the dead, then you're saved. And some people will take that verse and, and they'll preach it in such a way that people will think, well, then I'm good. All I got to do is confess and believe and, and I, don't need, I don't need to do any of this. But, but you understand the word believe that, that's used in that is an action word. And, and if you believe in your heart that Christ, that Christ was raised from the dead, it's actually going to result in, in, in the things that you do. And so a lot of people will, will get that verse twisted and, and, and use it as an excuse to not do anything and think, I'm saved. I know I'm saved because I confessed one time. A lot, you know, it's easy to say something. It's a, lot, it's a lot of, you know, you've heard the term, you know, actions speak louder than words, though. And so if you, if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, your, your actions will actually show if you actually believe in your heart. And I believe your actions would lead you to actually read the Word of God. Amen? So, and the second one is kind of two things. It's, it's pray, but it also uh, be still and listen. 
You know, you know, we need to pray. We need to pray all the time, the Bible says. Pray continuously. Pray without ceasing. And I, and I believe it, when we pray, we communicate with God, but then we also need to stop and be still sometimes. And I think for the society that we live in, being so, you know, ADD, that it's hard for us to sit down and just pray and, and, and then listen to God and, and listen for what the Spirit is leading us to do. And I think, so I, I put down two verses Second Chronicles seven fourteen. It's in the the beginning of your Bible, and it's a it's a pretty pretty important verse because it makes a pretty pretty big promise from God. Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse fourteen, and you, you might have heard the, heard this verse before. It's pretty popular, but it says in Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse fourteen, it says, "If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face." And turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. So, so if we if we humble ourselves and we pray and seek God's face, and turn from our wicked ways, then God will hear from heaven. And he and it says, and and will forgive their sin and heal their land. You know, if if you care about what's going on in your community, if you care about what's going on in the world today, this verse tells us exactly what we need to do. We need to seek God's face through prayer. We need to humbly humbly seek God's face through prayer, and and turn from our wicked ways and seek God, and He will hear us, and He and He will and He will heal heal our land and um, forgive our sins. Amen. So it's that's that's an important promise from God. If we do this, then God will do that. Amen. And so uh, the other one I have is, is Psalm 46.10. And that basically, Psalm 46.10 is where it says, Be still and know that I am God. You know, it's, and it's an important promise. We've got to know that God is in, in control. In Psalm 46.10 it says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. Understand that God is not, is, is not up in, in heaven you know, freaking out. You know, worrying about all the stuff that's going on. God is in control. So when we when we pray and we when we ask Him for things and we and when we seek His face, know that God is able. He hears us, and he, and so we can we can just take a minute to breathe, and just listen to Him and, and be still and know that He is God. Amen. So and so we have read God's word, pray and be still, and then the. The third thing I have, how we build our relationship with God, is in the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. It says, And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. And so, I mean, just, just now we just had worship. And that, that final song, I mean, I really felt the Spirit, you know, touch me when I, when I was praising God that I, for His faithfulness. And, and sometimes it's so good. You know, sometimes there isn't always words to express what we're going through. But when we just get into worshiping God, when we, we put on some songs, put on some music, or just, or just singing out loud, it, it, it does something in your spirit when you just start to worship God and, and praise Him for His holiness and, and His power. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel tremendous peace in my heart when I can just block out everything and I can just worship God. And it really does a lot for my building my relationship with Him. You know, uh, in Revelation chapter 5, uh, that's the last book of the Bible. In Re Revelation chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. Um, it gives us a picture of, of what it looks like in heaven. And so when, when we think about worshiping God, when we think about singing songs to Him, praising Him, saying how, how, how beautiful you are and how faithful you are, God, Look at, look at what's going on in heaven. This is, what, this is what John saw. He said, Then I looked and I heard a voice of many angels around the throne, and, li and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, know, and thousands of thousands, saying in a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. 
And it says in verse 13, it says that every living creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such, such as are in the sea and all of them were, were saying, Blessed, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and, and, and to the lamb forever and ever. This, that's, that's what's going on. That's what's going to happen when we enter into the kingdom of God, when we, when we enter into heaven. We're going to see, it says 10,000 time, times 10,000, that's 100 million angels, <laughs> you know, and you know, and just imagine that you're seeing all that, and they're all screaming, you know, worthy is the Lamb who is slain. And so when I when I worship God, you know, I kind of try and picture that, picture the throne of God, picture all these millions of of, of angels and and saints and everybody just worshiping God, and 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 that just you know fills me with the with this awe that that we should have for God, and and that's that's what builds our relationship with God when we we when we acknowledge His power and His Majesty and how how He is to receive all glory. And I, I believe it's a beautiful thing. It really, you know, is what it, it means to be a Christian, is to, is to be a worshiper of God. Amen? And then the final thing that I have, how do we build our relationship with God? You know, by reading His Word, by praying, by being still and listening, by worshiping Him. But then the fourth thing I put is by fellowship. By fellowship with God's people. The church is called the body of Christ. And so if we want to be in relationship with God, we need to be in relationship to the church. And look what it says, you know, in the book of Acts, it's, it, it shows what the beginning of the church looked like. In the book of Acts chapter 2, it shows what, what they were doing. In, in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 46 and 47. So this is, this is what the, 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 the beginning of the church looked like. And I, I believe that the, the, the command is still the same. I don't think anything has changed. We are still called to do this. If we want to be in relationship to God, we need to be in relationship to God's people and be part of the body. So in Acts chapter 2 verse 46, it says, so continuing daily in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That's what the beginning of the church looked like. And I believe if we want to build our relationship with God, that's how our lives should look. It shouldn't just be something we do for an hour on Sunday. It's, it's something that we should pursue doing daily. Every day I talk to, to one, some, you know, some of my brothers and sisters in the Lord. You know, I try and go to different Bible studies all around. Uh, sometimes I, I, I share at this, this um, recovery home that's up in Albuquerque. And then on Friday nights, there's, a, there's another uh, a recovery ministry. You know, that, that's, that's my history as I, as I help people get out of drug addiction because that's what God has led me out of. And so, that, so my, my ministry history has mostly been based on that. But every, every day, I want to have some contact with the body, body of Christ. You know, even if it's just on... Facebook, you know, re, you know, sharing a verse with somebody, something, some way to be in connection. Because, because it says right there, they continued daily in one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They, they, they went and they shared their lives together. And I think, you know, it's far too often in the church, in the churches, they, they, that's, people think that's, that's where they do their God thing. And then they, the rest of the time is theirs. And they separate, they, they, they kind of compartmentalize their, their, their faith and to something they do at church, and then they have, the rest of their time is when they focus on their lives. And I don't believe that's the picture of what it should, what it looks like to uh, really serve God. Father God, I pray for whoever's, whoever's in that ambulance right now, I pray that you help them. You know, it's crazy, since we've started this church, you know, almost every Sunday I will see some kind of ambulance or something go by, and, and it's just caused me to start praying now every time, because it's just a reminder to me of, of there's a lot of hurting people in this community. <laughs> And, and, and there's somebody every, every Sunday, apparently, that, 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 that has something going on. So, so I just want to pray for, pray for the community and pray for whoever it is that that, that's, that, that ambulance is going to help. Amen? So, but uh, fellowship, right? Fellowship with the body. We, we need to be in fellowship with one another if we're going to have a relationship with God. So many people say, oh, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to read the Bible. I don't need to do any of that. To, and I, I know God. I pray all the time. I'm, I'm, and you know what? I'm not going to argue with somebody. If, if they're, you're free to follow God however you want to follow God. But for, for, for my personal experience, what I've seen, people who, su who succeed and grow in faith, 
They're in the body. They, they are there every day. They're, they're doing something whenever the doors of the church are open, when, you know, they're, they're at home fellowships. And those are the people that I see God blessing and, and pouring his grace upon because they're humble enough to say they can't do it on their own. And, and they're, 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 they have enough discernment to know that the people in the world aren't going to help them grow in their relationship to God. Amen? And so uh, the other one, it's a, it's a very popular verse, and it, it pr basically answers the question, should we go to church or, or should we be in fellowship? In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse, uh, verse 25. And I like how, how, how this verse talks about, talks about uh, the, the last, as the day approaches, right? Let's see. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. It says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. And that's, you know, that's a, another way to not avoid being at church or being, being in fellowship with other Christians, um, as is the manner of some. Some people, you know, even in the, when they were writing the book of Hebrews, there were still people who didn't want to be in fellowship. But, and it says, but exhorting one another. Exhort to me, it means to encourage Exhort means to, 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 to uh, kind of just try and come alongside. And, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Now, it, it's, in most Bibles, that's a capital D on the day. And that means that that's the day that you stand before God. And some people will say, oh, that's, that's, that's the end of the world. You know, I mean, I, I see all, hear about all these people talking about the end times and how the world could end, a volcano or... You know, all these different prophecies, you know, the doomsday preppers and stuff like that. But the truth is, is the day you die, that's the end of the world for you. <laughs> that's the day you stand before God. And so the day is approaching. If you're alive, you're coming closer to that day where you stand before God. And so what should we do as we see that day approaching? The day we stand before God, we should exhort one another. We should, we should assemble together. We should be with the body of Christ. Because, you know, my brothers and sisters in the Spirit, I'm going to be seeing you guys a thousand years from now in heaven. You know, even, even my blood family, the, my blood fam family does, that doesn't believe in Christ, they're not going to be there. You guys are going to be there. And, and, and so, you know, there's a, there's a story when Jesus was, um, was preaching around Galilee, you know, he was, he was at some house and his mom and his brothers came to go take him home because they, they thought he was crazy or whatever. And, and, and they, they came into the meeting and they said, Jesus, your, your, your mom and your brothers are outside. And, and Jesus said, who is my mother and who is my brother? I tell you, everyone who obeys the word of my father, that is my mother and brother and sister. And so, so those, that, those, that's our real family, according to what the scripture says. And, and, and so my continual prayer over the past nine years is that I would consider my spiritual family, I mean, as much or even more than I consider my blood family. I love my blood family, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but, but, I, but I truly, I believe that, that, that God has it desires for us to build our spiritual family and to consider our spiritual family just as much as we consider our blood blood family amen so and then so we dealt with our that, that's how we deal with our vertical relationship to god we we read his word we pray we be still and listen we worship him we fellowship with the body of christ if you want to build your relationship with god those are the things you need to do I mean, you can argue with that. You can argue with the scripture. It's completely up to you. But I, but I have seen people who do that, they succeed. They, 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 they have the blessings of God on their life. And he guides their steps and he leads them into paths of righteousness. And that's, that's what I want for anybody who hears this message to, to understand. That, 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 that God, is, God is able to do above and beyond what we could ever imagine. But we, but we need to be willing to seek him. You know, um, but, uh, but I'll get to that. Actually, let, let me, the final thing I want to say about our, our vertical relationship is in the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 37 through 39. And actually, this covers the, the vertical and the horizontal. Matthew, chapter 22. And this is one of my favorite scriptures. I mean, I have this one posted on my wall at home. Matthew, chapter 22, verse 37 and 39. And this is when a lawyer came to test Jesus to see if he knew about the law. And this is what Jesus said in verse 37. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And in verse 39, it says, the second is like it, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right there, you can see the vertical 
and the horizontal. But, but the first and great commandment is that we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So if we want to be obedient to what God wants from us, well, the first and greatest commandment is to love him. And how are we going to love him? By, by what, what we just talked about. We love God by reading his word. We love God by praying to, praying to him. We love God by worshiping him. And we love God by being in fellowship with the body. Amen? And so now how do we love our neighbor as we love ourselves? Well, that's, that's talking about the horizontal relationship, our relationship to people. And so basically, I've seen it done where, where they, they lay out a basic hierarchy for our interpersonal relationships. And, and this is, I mean, I believe it's supported by, the, by what, the, what the Bible says as well. But our first and most, uh, our closest relationship is our spouse. And, and you know, I've gone to, to marriage uh, seminars and retreats and stuff like that to where they talk about on earth, the, the, our greatest picture of, of what it's like to be with God and, and the, uh, I mean, God's relationship to the church is, his, is our relationship to our spouse. So let's see what it says in, in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. This is talking about, you know, husbands relating to their spouses, you know, to their wives. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, it says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects our husband. Me and my wife went, uh, you know, started a Bible, or went to a Bible study uh, years ago, and, and, the, and the guy leading the Bible study was going through this book, I think we have it on the shelf back there, called Love and Respect. And it's according to that verse right there. It says, men, we are called to love our wives. In, in Ephesians 5.23, it says, for the husband, uh, or, or says, um, let's see, for the husband is ahead of, uh, wives submit to your own husbands. It says, husbands, in, in verse 25, it says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And then in verse 33, it says, let each, each husband in particular love his own wife. So the call to the husband is to be loving. And then it says to the wife, let each wife um, respect her husband. And, and so, so it kind of gives us the way that God has wired men and the way that God has wired women, that, God, that men need to, to, to be conscious of how they're loving their wives and being considerate and loving and, and cherishing their wives. And then um, husbands or wives need to be conscious of how they are respecting their husbands. You know, and, and that's, I, I've seen so many cases where that's a, that's a point of gritted teeth. You're like, ugh. <laughs> you know, respect, the, you know, I'll respect that guy when he deserves some respect. And, and, and it's a big point of contention in a lot of relationships. And I, and, and I just encourage, I just share what the scripture says. And that's, that's your relationship with God. If, if, if you want to obey what the scripture says, and, and sometimes I don't always agree with what the scripture says, but I am called by, by God to submit to his word. Even if I don't agree with it, I'm called to submit to it. And, and I, I believe those people that I've seen do that, even though they don't necessarily want to do it, but they'll, they'll go ahead and out of respect for God, they will respect their husbands. And, you know, the women that I've seen do that, I've seen the relationship grow. And, 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 it's, and, and, and it's, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy to do something that's contrary to your, to your physical nature. But, but like I talked about before, there's the flesh, and the spirit, and if you want to walk in the spirit, you got to walk in love. Love is patient, kind, and, and it does all these things. The only way that we're going to do, we're going to succeed in all these things, is if we walk in the spirit. The only way I believe a woman can actually respect their husband the way the, the way God is, is is encouraging them to do so is by pouring into the spirit and letting God transform their heart. And when you let God transform your heart, it will it will give you the ability to obey His commands. Amen. And secondly, um, children. So, so you love your spouse. You know, w women respect your husbands, and let men love your wives the, the way Christ lo uh, loved the church. Lay your life down for them. And then your children. You know, the Bible uh, in Proverbs it says, you know, raise up your children in the way they should go, and and when they are old, they will not depart from it. And then I also put Ephesians. We're still in the book of Ephesians, chapter six, um, verse four. It says, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And so, 
You know, it's, it's kind of weird. What does that mean to provoke your children to wrath? I don't believe that it means just let your kids do whatever they want. I mean, that's not training them up <laughs> in, in, in the ways of the Lord. I be, but I do believe that there is a, a certain portion that we shouldn't, we should be in relation with our kids. We should understand our kids. We should be talking to our kids and, and getting to know our kids. Because if, if it's just a point where, you're, where, where your kids are there to obey and, and learn and, and do, uh, do what they're told. And, and, and then the, I think the, the number one thing I see when relating to children, I mean, this is what I grew up with, do as I say, not as I do. The, the, the Hippocratic, you know, oath or something like that. I mean, and, and, and for me, I, I believe that is what provokes children to wrath. When they see their parents telling them, oh, don't do this, but then, then their parents are doing it, like drinking or smoking or something like that, I think we need to lead, lead by example. Because if we don't lead by example, I believe we stand uh, in a great chance of provoking our children to, to wrath. I mean, I, it was such a point that, uh, that would just anger me when I was a kid, you know, that, that my parents would tell me to do all these things, but they wouldn't do any of the things. And for me, so for me as a parent, I try not to tell my children to do anything that, that I'm not willing to do myself or have done. And, 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 and so I, I try and lead by example continually. And I try and be in relation to, relationship with them to understand how they're thinking and what's going on in their lives as much as I can. I mean, kids, especially teenagers, it's, it's, it's like, you know, my theory is, you know, the Bible says that you will reap what you sow, and all the bad things you've done in your life, you, you're reaping that when you get teenagers. Because <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to you when your kids turn teenagers. But the truth is that God has given us the ability through His Spirit to really relate to our children. I know of one very tragic incident where the, where the, where the, the child was provoked to wrath so much that he ended up killing the whole family. And so it's a, it's a very tragic and, and scary thing to think about it. I mean, these days, there's kids with, you know, there, if there's guns in the house, or even without guns. I mean, if you provoke your child to wrath, they might not kill you, but they might kill themselves. There was just a story uh, in the news where this, where this father cut the girl's hair and put a YouTube video of, of him cutting the girl's hair because she did something. She got high on something. And then, then a, a little while later, she jumped out of the car and jumped off, jumped off a bridge. And, and, and it's like, wow. I mean, we got to be careful. We got to love our children, and, and, and we got to. I think if we, if we look at how First Corinthians thirteen talks about love, love does not behave rudely. Love is not provoked. We should apply that to our relationship to our children too. Amen. So, and the third thing, the third ring. I mean, because I've seen it done where they they have your your circle, your your spouse, your children, and then and then your family. Now, I, I put both, both your church family and your, your blood family are in this circle of family. And for me, I, I think it should be related to the same way, that, that we, should, we should call up our church friend as much as we call up our brother and, or sister, our blood brother and sister. Let's go to the book of Galatians again. It's one book over, Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. It says... Therefore, as we have honor, opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those of the household of faith. And, and, there, and that, I think that's another encouraging verse that we should consider those. Those that are believers in Christ, we're all in the household of faith. You know, it's a cool thing, though, is to, to imagine that. We have a family that spreads global. And <laughs> no matter where I go, I can find a brother, a sister, you know, uh, you know, that, 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 you know, that if they really believe the scripture, you know, they can, that uh, I, I try and do the ex extend, um, hospitality to my family all over the world. And I, and I, it's awesome to see when I go into a new city and I, and I talk to somebody, it's just like you meet a family member that you haven't talked to in a long time. Amen. So, just, just relate to our family with, um, with kindness. Like the verse we read in the very beginning, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. I mean, that's a big one right there, forgiving one another. You know, in a family, every, you know, people, arguments happen, people get mad, people behave certain ways. But if we're going to obey Christ, we need to forgive one another. Because why? Because even as God has forgiven us, that's, that's what, it, what it is to be a Christian is to be a forgiver. You, <laughs> because you've been forgiven, Amen. And then finally, our, our work, uh, our work relationship, our horizontal relationship to, to, to work. And I, and I just got this verse uh, in First Peter. And so, some, you know, would say this is a verse talking about 
how, how the Bible supports slavery. I, I don't believe so. I believe the words that they use are completely applicable to just a, a, a boss and an employee. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16 through 18, let's see what it says. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16 through 18. And it says, in verse 16, it starts off as free, yet not, not using your, your liberty as a cloak or a vice, but as servants of God, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. And in verse 18, it says, servants be submissive to your masters. Now, you could, I, I believe it would be perfectly applicable and perfectly legitimate to say, um, employees be submissive to your bosses. With, with, with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. I don't know if you've ever had a harsh boss or in a, in a relationship at work that's been, that's been difficult to deal with, but if you want to represent Christ, if you want to do what the Bible says, then, then we should be uh, submissive, we should be, we should be yes sir, no sir, do what we're told, and we do it to the best of our abil ability because we're not working for them, we're working for God. God has given us the opportunity to be in that position of work. So God calls us to, to just work as unto the Lord, not as unto man. Amen? And I, I believe we, if, if we do that, that then we're going to see God's grace and God's um, blessing upon our horizontal relationships. And so this, this next passage of Scripture, I believe, I mean, it's, is one of the passages of Scripture that really spoke to me according to this, um, this whole study Let's go to the book of Romans, chapter 12. And this is basically how we should live as Christians. I mean, this, this whole, so this study, I mean, is not just relationships in general, but this, is, this study is relationships for Christians, I guess would be a good, would be a better title. Uh, how, how Christians should, should live out relationships. Because if, if you're not a Christian, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you haven't committed your life to God, then all this stuff might not be making any sense to you at all. And it might be completely contrary to, to the way you go. But I encourage you, if you don't know Christ, if you, if, you, if you haven't committed your life to God, and you want to see a victory over the struggle of relationships, I would say, you know, spend some time. You know, the, the, Jesus said, when you pray, go into your closet where nobody else is and just spend time with you and God. And I would encourage you, uh, to, to go and, and, and get away from everybody else, close your door to your room, and really pray to God and say, Lord, I, I, don't, know if, I don't know if you're real, but you know, I want to be saved. If you're real, save me. You know, and, and God will, will, will pour his spirit out upon you. I've seen it happen. It's happened in my life. So in the book of Romans, chapter 12, for, for, for all the, the Christians out there, this is very, very very important and it's and it's really practical so let's see what it says in Romans chapter 12 verse 9 it says let love be without hypocrisy period and then it goes on to the next thing so so let love be without hypocrisy the first thing that that the world wants to point at the church and say you know, and I'm sure you've all heard it bunch of hypocrites right I mean so so if we're gonna live and honor God with our Christianity with you know, walking with God we need to love without hypocrisy hypocrisy is telling someone not to lie but lying hypocrisy is is, is, is saying something you know judging somebody else for doing something that you're you are in fact doing yourself and so if we're going to love without hypocrisy, we need to not judge others before, you know, Jesus said, take the plank out of your own eye before you try and take the speck out of your brother's eye. And, and so if we, if we can, if we want to love without hypocrisy, we need to love but with, without judging other people. But, but, and it says, uh, the next part says, abhor what is evil. I mean, hate what's evil. I mean, that's, that's part of what it is to love God, is to hate. If you love babies, you should probably hate abortion, right? <laughs> and so, and then it says, cling to what is good. You know, loving people is good. Being generous is good. Yeah, uh, being, being forgiving is a good thing. So, so that's what we should cling to. In verse 10, it says, be kindly and affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer distributing to the needs of the saints and given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on, on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. 
If it is possible, as much depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If, you're, if, you're, if he is thirsty, give him, give him drink. For in doing so, you will reap, uh, or you will heap hot coals onto his head. In verse 21, it says, Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And, and so that whole piece of scripture right there, I believe, is very practical, very easy to understand. It explains how we are supposed to live as Christians, blessing those who persecute us, not trying to avenge ourselves, knowing that God is the avenger. He will take, he, he will take vengeance on those who bring hardship into our life. We don't need to, to go and, and, and put, you know, point a gun at anybody. We don't need to do any of that. God will, will repay. Amen. And we need to be, uh, it says, not lacking, lagging in diligence, but fervent in spirit. You know, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saint and giving, giving hospitality. That's a picture of some, you know, if somebody who lived that out, those are the people I would want to be around, right? <laughs> And, and so we should want to be those people. We should, we should read that piece of scripture over and over again and say, Lord, make me that person. <laughs> make me that person who doesn't get angry at everybody else. Make me that person who isn't always seeking to get somebody back. You know, I'm going to get you back. That's, that's, not, that's not the words of a Christian. It says, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome the evil with good. That's, that's like what, it call, what it means to be a Christian. So... I basically only had one main takeaway truth from this whole study on relationships. And, and so it goes like this. Everything flows from our vertical relationship to God. And the way, uh, the way to overcome um, the very real struggles we face in the realm of relationships is to press in toward your relationship to God. If you want to overcome the, the, the struggles in relationships, you need to get your vertical correct. And, and then... The healthier your relationship with God is, the healthier all of your relationships will be. And, and, that's, and it sounds great. And I, I was talking to my wife about it earlier. I mean, God wants us to be loving people. And she says, like, with some people, that's impossible. And I, and I said, you're right. It is impossible. <laughs> some people, it's just impossible to love. But, but in, in Luke chapter 18, verse 21, Jesus said this. He says, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. So, so it's not possible for us to live all this out in our own strength. It's only possible for us to, to, to live this out through the Spirit of God. And I pray that, that, you, would, that you would pour in and press into that, to, to that relationship with God, that you might be able to glorify your Father in heaven and forgive others as he has forgiven you. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for, for loving us, for forgiving us, and, and for giving us a blueprint for how, how we can do relationships to where, to where it, you know, our relationships will be a, a joy, where, where we will actually inspire people and we, and we will actually you know, it, um, raise up our children in a way that's, that's beneficial to them, that we equip them with a, with a way to be um, as an example of how, of how we should live. And so I pray for... For uh, everyone who hears this message, Lord, I pray that, that it wouldn't be my words, but it would be your word that would sink into their heart. That, that they would understand that, that you, know, I, I'm, you know, I'm just a broken vessel, Lord, that, 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 that desires to pour out your truth, Lord. But So I pray that, that, that even though my words are not as eloquent and in my, in my stuttering, I pray, pray that, that your spirit would be able to overcome anything that I lack in preaching this message, Lord, that it would be your truth that goes forth, that souls would be saved, that, that hearts would be changed, and relationships would be built by, by believing in you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead.